give us a quick two minutes on this one yeah, for me. Sure. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, just straight off the bat, I just want to dispel a myth uh, about uh, uh, about SDPs. That let me just uh, state it clearly that SDP is not an IMS concept. Um, and uh, many, you know, a lot of uh, telco uh, advancements in um, in some of these standards-based or open technologies are associated with IMS, but uh, um, for better or for worse, uh, uh, SDP is not necessarily an IMS concept at all. In fact, to me, I see it as a confluence of uh, of web technologies and telco technologies, both uh, trying to achieve the same goal, which is to offer common platforms to enable applications proliferation. And, and SDP is the confluence of those two trends. Uh, if you look at the web world, the, the trend has uh, moved from, I mean, the classic O'Reilly chart of web 1.0 on the left and, and web, web 2.0 on the, on the right, you know, taxonomy uh, to, um, uh, what's that, tag, tag clouds, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, you know. So that trend, um, underlines a, a fundamental move towards making the web as a platform and and IMS actually uh, is a was or has been a parallel trend that may have conceived may have been conceived out of uh, achieving cost efficiencies and operational efficiencies but the, again the fundamental driving theme behind it is to enable applications and to lay down uh, a layered framework uh, in order to provide or, or make it easy to, to, to deploy applications agnostic of access or devices. Um, and, and where these two trends really meet is the SDP, um, and it, it really comes out of, um, outside, of, uh, outside of the whole uh, IMS mindset. So okay. I just wanted to dispel that myth, myth uh, right off the bat. Okay, so, so to, to make it real, um, name some SDP vendors, people who actually make the SDPs. Um, actually, uh, to mind the biggest the biggest vendors that that come to mind are uh, really Oracle and um, and us. Uh, yeah. um, uh, in, from from Oracle's point of view, their uh, their entry into and the reason I say Oracle is because they recently acquired BEA, so they kind of uh, mm -hmm. converged everything yeah. together. So otherwise, it would have been Oracle, BEA, and us, I guess, uh, and and probably IBM, but um, not as much as uh, in the real real time yeah. communications. Okay space as uh, as some of the others okay. and the reason i say is because so the vendors have up, up, uh, arrived at this from two different sides uh, for example oracle has arrived at it from the oss or operational uh, operational uh, support services side similarly bea has been uh, fairly very well uh, let's say um, uh, uh, adopted in the enterprise uh, communications and the enterprise um, application side as an ASP and then it has evolved into um, into being used by IT departments within the telcos okay. and then slowly it's evolving as a real-time services platform but and for us we've actually arrived at it from the right which is we our core competence has always been in real-time services and our DNA is in high performance and fault tolerance platforms and what we've done is we've essentially added uh, or embraced open technologies like Linux and, and the J2EE stack and web mm -hmm. services and, and kind of try to leverage our core competence and offer it up as, as an API. Okay. Great. Uh, and and that's, that's really what STPs are anyway. Excellent. Great. Thank you. All right. So, um, so Crick, given that's what STPs are and it's a platform for applications, Ribbit's a platform for applications. How is what you're doing different than what you might get from Sonus? Can you give me some, some differences there? Yeah, uh, sure, for the, the first difference is that you don't buy a stack of equipment from Ribbit. Uh, right. As uh, an enterprise, for example, you can use our API to embed telephony into the applications that you're, you're doing. So you can create what was just software and turn it into voiceware, we call it. You don't have to install equipment. You don't have to rack it out. You don't do anything like that. You go get a developer kit. It's free. You build the app. You run it. You're good. Uh, if you're a carrier and you want to deploy a Ribbit application or an application that's built using the Ribbit components, we would attach to you through a SIP trunk, not necessarily host all the equipment in your network, and it interoperates as a feature server on your network. So you can still have a service delivery platform within your carrier network. You can still have an IMS, and then we we can we ride on the side, and we can provide 
the call it a gateway, if you will, into your network as a carrier for the developers on the outside. And so then anything that's created using that um, structure can run on your telephony uh, network and you can manage your billing processes with your existing systems. Okay, great, great. okay, good. So um, so you can write on the side. So, so then let me pass it to Shai for a second. So um, if, if SDPs are things that you build applications upon, Right, um, right. right. That, that truth. Yes. That truth. True statement. And and uh, Ribbit, which is um, another plat platform application, is, is somewhat similar, but but it's actually more of an SAS model. Um, so, Shai, tell me a little bit about building your application and some of the approaches that you looked at and threw away or used. Or uh, you're you're going to sit sit here for a minute as being the guys who actually used some of their stuff. And what I want you to, to tell us is. When you approached it, did you even think about SDPs? Did you even think about, you know, Ribbit platforms? How did you first go at this? Well, the, the nice thing about Phonolo is that it can work with or without a carrier. Um, you can go to phonolo.com or in private beta now and apply for a, a password. And um, there's no reason why we could not operate as a direct-to-consumer service. Uh, we could put out a mobile application, and we could try to drive traffic to our site, uh, try to make Phonolo a brand name, um, and try to charge users a uh, monthly fee to use it, or try to recoup the cost through advertising. Um, so there are a lot of guys out there trying to partner with carriers where that's not possible. They have to connect through some sort of SDP, some sort of mechanism, or their application doesn't work. If you're a ringback tone vendor, there, there is no ringback tone without some sort of carrier partnership. So in our case, we are act, we actively chose to take this path because we th we believe this is the this is the best go to market strategy. We believe there's a strong need from carriers for these new features. Uh, so I, I guess the question is funny because we don't actually, you know, we, our service could work with or without a carrier. So the next question is, okay, if we're going to work with a carrier. How are we going to do that? And I, I spent some time looking into IMS um, when we started this, and I was initially very excited. I'm like, hey, this is great. The carriers put out an SDK. That's awesome. And you know, the more I looked into it, the more I realized uh, you know, that's really not what it is. Uh, it's, it's a very tangled business, um, lots of different revisions out there. Carriers have not uniformly deployed it. They've deployed it in different stages. It doesn't always do what you want. And I realized, you know, this is not the holy grail it seems to be. Um, and then the more I looked, the more I realized that guys partnering with carriers um, and bringing features out there are just doing it in, uh, you know, whatever ad hoc manner makes the most amount of sense. So you look, for example, at Looped partnering with Sprint and Boost. Uh, uh, and uh, so they've got this great geolocation service. And, and that's not IMS-based. They wrote applications that sit on the handset. Uh, or you look at Spinvox, which does this great thing of translating voicemail and sends it to you as, as an SMS. Um, and that's not IMS either. That's not done through any official SDP. Um, so what I see out there and what we're doing is that you know, each application, uh, you, there are lots of ways you can work with carriers. There's just not a, there's not a unified principle there. It's based on what application you, uh, you have and how you need to connect with them. And it seems to me like in most cases, uh, a, a SIP trunk is really the only magic you need. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go very far with just SIP. Yeah, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. You know, that, that sort of reminds me of, a, of um, my first my first face-to-face -face interaction with a Web 2.0 telephony company. I was um, here in last March, about a year and a half ago, and I went down to... Um, see the folks at Twitter who aren't that far from here. And it was a very interesting meeting for me because at the time I was working um, uh, at a company that was making a lot of SMS equipment. So I, I knew something about SMS. And Twitter, you know SMS, right? So I, so I, um, I went to see actually someone else in the building and they were there so I stopped by and said hello to them. I got to talk with some of their guys and I remember asking them, well this is really great. Um, would you mind explaining your, your SMS back, back plane and how you How'd you provision this? And you know, where's where's this stuff? And you just, right? And they're like, "What do you mean? Like, well, what vendors are you using? You know, what kind of hardware did you buy?" And smiles are getting bigger. You know, like what a idiot, you know, from the from the East Coast, right? And and of course, of course, you know, Twitter doesn't buy any SDPs. They don't they don't they don't buy 
um, packet data gateways. They don't buy SMS equipment. They don't do that. Why should they? They have, they get aggregators and they just call the APIs. And so, so for, first of all, it was a little disturbing to me. I'm like, oh, wait a second. Do they really know what they're doing? I mean, like, how can they guarantee quality? And maybe they don't sometimes. <laughs>